Now I'd like to introduce today's featured presenter, Professor Robert Sutton. Bob Sutton is a professor of management science and engineering at Stanford University. He co-founded the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and the Hasso Plattner Institute of Design, also known as the D-School. He is a fellow at IDEO, senior scientist at Gallup, and an advisor to McKinsey and Company. Bob studies organizational change, leadership innovation, and workplace dynamics. He's published over 150 articles and chapters and written seven books. Bob's latest book is The Asshole Survival Guide, How to Deal with People Who Treat You Like Dirt. His website is bobsutton.net, and his Twitter handle is at, is at work underscore matters. Now I'm going to turn it over to Bob. All right. Thanks, Sherry. Great to be here, and um, I would like to welcome everybody who's joining us. Uh, this is going to be kind of my first major presentation of the ideas in my book, so I'm really excited about this. And uh, so let's jump into it, and what I'm going to do is I'll talk for 25, 30 minutes or so, and, um, and then uh, we'll open it up for your questions. And so just keep those questions coming, and we'll answer as many as we possibly can. I love questions, especially difficult ones. So ask me the hard ones. Um, all right. So, so um, let me give you a, a little context about uh, both the story I'm going to be telling today and, um, and the book that I'm going to be talking about. So about 10 years ago, um, I accidentally got involved in uh, writing a book about workplace jerks, a book called, uh, called The No Asshole Rule. And there were a couple strange things about that. One, I never really considered myself an expert on workplace jerks, but one thing led to another. And uh, things kind of reached the point where I would go to professional events to talk about leadership or innovation or something, and people, for example, McKinsey Consulting, they would introduce me, is this is Bob Sutton, he's done all this stuff, but really he'll always be the asshole guy. So I got this kind of weird situation, and uh, I kind of resisted writing uh, kind of a sequel to the book. The, the reason that there was pressure for a sequel, besides the fact that the first book sold well, so they always want a sequel, um, is that the first book really focused on organizational cultures, how to br build an organizational culture that was a relatively civilized workplace. And, but the response to it was just about everybody I ever met at a cocktail party, my barber, uh, professional events, journalists, because I talked to a lot of journalists, and I got 8,000 emails that all essentially asked the same question, which was, um, help, I'm dealing with an asshole or a bunch of them, what do I do? And the range of these things was unbelievable. For example, a Costco worker who had, who had um, jerky, um, had a, a boss who was a jerk. Another example of uh, somebody who, who was a jerk was, um, was a, a local CEO who described board holes and douche boards who were driving him crazy. I had a Baptist minister write me about mean parishioners and what to do about it. And, and then a lot of questions about clients, and they, and they kind of went over and over again. And, and so what I do while I worked on other stuff, such as uh, leadership and scaling and innovation and stuff like that, I kind of keep a running uh, folder of all these different emails, and I said, well, maybe I'll get to them someday. And, and, and just to give you one more sort of example, um, so here's a cartoon. So one of the fun things we did for this book is we had this cartoonist, David Wilson, who's a, actually a political cartoonist for a newspaper in Florida. And uh, so he drew some cartoons based on the new book, The Asshole Survival Guide. And I, had this, and I had this guy write me an email, really long email, about how he spent seven years working for what he, what he called an A dollar, dollar hole factor, factory, an asshole factory, where there was just meanness everywhere, there was a mean owner. He described how he had he turned mean and he had trouble sleeping, he had physical health problems, he had trouble with his relationship with the significant people in his life. Um, and, um, and one of the favorite scenes, and, and this is one of those weird things that jerky people do, is they're weird about food. So the picture there is what would happen is that the owner would walk up to him and stick his hand into his bags of potato chips and just eat them without permission. So, that's, so these sort of questions 
<clears throat> and stories that I would hear were kind of the focus of the book and, and what we're going to talk about in, in the uh, following 20 minutes or so are some of the lessons that I've learned in this adventure uh, over the last decade to try to understand how to address really this one question, because this book just addresses one question in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm dealing with a jerk or a bunch of them, especially in the workplace, what do I do about them? All right. So let me start out and talk a little bit, in addition to this big pile of emails that I was getting, uh, that. That, that I that I was that I was um, getting um, that, um, over the years, the academic literature on all things assholes absolutely exploded over the years. So, um, and, if you, and if you do a search of uh, search engines that are especially for scholarly research, things like abusive supervision, abusive customers, bullying, uh, workplace victimization, you can see the list there. It's just astounding how much research there is that academics have um, compiled over the years. And um, although, and we might want to talk about this in the Q&A, there actually might be situations where you individually might be able to get ahead at least for a little while by treating other people like dirt. Um, so there's some controversy there about what are the conditions under which, if you will, uh, assholes finish first. There's not a lot. Um, but the thing that comes through these literally thousands of studies is that if you are, if you will, if you will, in firing range, if you're around people who treat others with disrespect in a demeaning fashion, who are rude, um, who do backstabbing, we can talk about um, some of the main, if you will, kinds of dirty work that jerks do. It's all bad news, thousands of studies. So if you look on the left-hand side of the side, the slide, the evidence for well-being that if you are confronting, especially over a long period of time, but even short little snippets, someone who, who leaves you feeling bad about yourself, like dirt, anxiety, depression, poor relationships with other people in your family. There's great longitudinal studies even done in the UK that show that people who have uh, nasty bosses have heart problems and um, higher mortality rates. So that's the one side that for you it's bad, and then in terms of stuff that, well, might be bad for your career and bad for your employer, less productivity, more errors, poor customer service. So uh, what ends up happening is if your boss and coworkers treat you like dirt, you in turn, it's, if you will, shit rolls downhill, will we'll treat clients bad as well. There's some great research in uh, large chains of fast food restaurants that when the manager who runs the restaurant treats the employees badly, they waste and steal more food, and uh, turnover, absenteeism. So, so regardless of uh, maybe these, con these conditions, which we could talk about, when maybe being a jerk helps you uh, get ahead, it's a pretty rare set of situations and probably overestimated. It's bad for your organization and bad for your health to be around people like this. So, uh, so that's a very clear message from, uh, from the academic research. Uh, one other thing, and here's another one of these Dave Wilson uh, cartoons that's also important. Another way in which it's bad for you is that if you are around uh, people who treat you with disrespect and jerks, it's a contagious disease. It's a contagious disease in two ways that come out of the academic literature. One is if you are around nasty people, um, you are likely to catch it just like a common cold. They can produce this in the laboratory. They bring in a, a subject. They treat him or her like dirt, and they bring in another subject, and that turn, person turn, turns into a dirt, it turns into a nasty person. And there's also evidence, the breed like rabbits quotes, that there's this thing that the Harvard professor, famous Harvard professor um, named Rosabeth Cantor, she described it as homosocial reproduction, that organizations tend to people pick people who are just like them. So literally, jerks are more likely to hire jerks. So if you hire one or two, be careful, they will breed like rabbits. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to start moving to the survival um, part of the show, if you will. But before I do, let me give you a little mental provisioning. And something that really I've learned, especially over the last decade, both from the academic research uh, from talking to people who are jerks, and honestly, when I've been a jerk myself too, uh, 
we human beings have so many self-serving biases. We're so bad at seeing our weaknesses that, um, including for things like disrespect or um, assholes, that, that we're, we're not very good at recognizing when we've treated others with disrespect or are consistently disrespectful or nasty. But um, on top of that, we're pretty quick to blame other forces outside of ourselves. So, so if you want a kind of, if you will, mental provisioning, um, a mantra as you're dealing with managing situations where you feel as if you're being demeaned, um, de-energized, oppressed, whatever, I would sort of suggest be slow to label others as assholes, but be quick to label yourself as one because you're, by doing so, you're countervailing a whole bunch of other psychological forces, well-documented psychological forces that push you the other direction. Okay, so here's my four main sets of survival methods. These are chapters in the Asshole Survival Guide. So let's sort of jump in and, uh, and start talking about them. The first one, the best thing you can do is uh, make a clean getaway. If you are in a situation, it could be a customer. We'll talk about customers in a little bit. It could be um, a coworker. It could be a boss. It could be a Lord of the Flies situation where everybody treats everybody else like dirt. Uh, doing the best you can to get out as quickly as you can is really smart. Um, and I've got Johnny Paycheck. You may have heard the famous uh, Johnny Paycheck song, Take This Job and Shove It. But my reaction is, yes, do this, but don't be stupid about it in such a way that it particularly ruins your career and your reputation. And just one little example I suspect many of you have heard of um, is back in 2010, there was a guy named Steven Slater who was briefly an American folk hero. So what happened was he's a flight attendant on JetBlue Airlines, and he has two legs with a couple of really, really obnoxious female passengers who are just berating him. So he lands the second time, I believe it was in Pittsburgh, and one of the um, folks who had been berating him, one of the customers, she stands up early while a plane's still taxiing, opens the overhead luggage, and he runs up to stop her, and he gets hit on the head really hard. So he's pissed and he's been abused by these people for a, a few hours. So what he does is, famously, he gets on the microphone, cusses them all out, calls, tells them they're all jerks, says he quits, and that's where you see the slide, grabs two beers, and act, activates the slide, and, and runs away from the airplane. And so if you want a made-for-media, take this job and shove it story, this is perfect. But let's go back to the don't be stupid about it. He expressed regret later. He got fired. He got fined. He was on probation for a year. So it's one of those things that might feel good in the moment, and as somebody who has sometimes has limited emotional self-control, uh, I know it's often good to have a plan. And, and that's one of my general models and mantras in the book, too, it, back to it's good to have a plan, is that uh, I wish I could just give you a formula or a decision tree that uh, if you have a jerk, if you do these three things, everything's going to be great. But unfortunately, we all are in such different situations that I can't give you a one-size-fits-all solution. So each one of us, if you will, has to craft our own asshole survival plan based on what we know and in consultation with people who we know and trust. All right. So one other thing. So I'm talking about uh, making a clean getaway. Even better than that is when you're going through the interview process, the job search process, any sorts of information you can get that you are about to get involved with somebody who is going to treat you like dirt and be disrespectful, it's really important to look for. Of course, you, you, can, uh, you can do things like read Glassdoor online, which isn't that reliable because you don't know what part of the organization you're going to end up in. Uh, socially uh, positive gossip is really important. If you have friends who or people you can get to, friends of friends of friends, who work in the work group you're going to go to, that's probably the best information. And uh, if you can have some early meetings, you might look for red flags. Um, and just the example I'm going to talk about, so the reason I've got a hippo there is if you think about hippos, hippos have a big mouth and they have little ears. So, so that's one way in which hippos are difficult to work with. Also, there's another meaning of hippos, some of you probably heard of, which is the highest paid person in the room. And, and those two things usually go together. So anyhow, this is 
eight or ten years ago, and one of my co-authors, who I've actually done a lot with at Stanford, uh, at, at, uh, at the Stanford Center for Professional Development, and, and we've written books together and stuff, Huggy Rao. So Huggy and I had this potential consulting client, and we flew to Boston for an all-day meeting. And we're trying to figure out how much to work with this guy and his team. So we're in this, this conference room for 10 hours, nine hours, one of those horrible all-day meetings. And the guy who was head of the group, he talked and he talked and he talked and he talked and he, and he only made statements. He never asked us any questions. He talked and he talked and it's about two o'clock and so finally he sits ne down next to me and he, he was actually silent and somebody else talked. And he leans over and he looks at me and he said, there's the quote, it looks like I'm listening but I'm really just reloading, trying to figure out what I'm gonna do next. So after that meeting, Huggy and I very quickly um, announced to our client that we were too busy to work with him. And, and I think that saved us a lot of aggravation. All right, the next set of, of approaches. So if you're in a situation where, where you actually can't avoid, if you will, working with for a short or a long period of time with people who are jerks, um, the way that I think about it is, is that um, assholeness is sort of like kryptonite, all sorts of evidence that the closer you are to this nasty stuff, the more frequent your exposure and the more intense exposure, uh, the worse your physical and mental health will be and also the more likely you are to turn into a jerk. So this is my colleague, Katie DeSellis, that's actually her picture um, at CNN and she, on CNN, and she visited Stanford a couple of years ago and she studies all things assholes. She studies air rage. She studies the relationship between prison guards and prisoners. She studies temper tantrums by basketball coaches to see the effects of it. Um, she, it so it was really great having her um, next order. And I, I said to Katie at some point working on the book, so Katie, what's the most important single bit of advice you have? And I kind of like her, don't engage with crazy. And she means create as much distance from crazy as you possibly can given the reality of your life. Okay, so let me give you an example of, of something that I learned from a former doctoral student I know about how to limit the exposure. And, and this, to me, this is a really important, powerful method when you can't make a full ex escape. And this idea of sort of slowing the rhythm to reduce uh, the contact. And in this instant world we're in, we get emails and texts and stuff all hours of the night. Um, people can send them repeatedly, phone calls, meetings, and so on. And, and what this doctoral student did was she figured out, as the quote there says, well, that she had a batshit crazy advisor. He would do things like call her at 3 in the morning and yell at her and rant at her write her repeated one email after another, after another, often very critical and often very hostile. Um, and, the, and, and she's kind of stuck with this dissertation advisor is trying to figure out what to do. And she starts realizing that for him, and there are certain sorts of assholes, especially Machiavellian assholes, who um, your, if you will, your pain is their pleasure. When they see you, that really long explanatory email, they see you suffering, they see you crying, they see you squirming, the pleasure centers in their brain light up. And this is the kind of asshole she was dealing with. So what she learned to do was to slow the rhythm. So if he called, she wouldn't answer it, or she would answer every fifth or sixth call. If he sent a nasty email, she'd wait for the next nasty email, the next nasty email, email. And the first year or so, she'd wait a couple of days. And by the time she finished her PhD, she'd wait two or three weeks and just send one sort of neutral email response and wait another few weeks. Same thing with meetings. She, w she had the meeting stretch out first weekly, bi-weekly, then monthly. A and this idea of, of slowing the rhythm is one of the things that you might be able to do within the constraint of a real job. Another thing, and I didn't put it in this deck, but it's really important. There's really great research that if, if especially for those of you who work in an open office environment, if you can get a little bit away, physically far away from the jerks in your office, it has a huge positive effect. In fact, there's a great um, long-term study that was just published, was described in the Harvard Business Review in places, that shows that when people sit within 25 feet of a toxic coworker, the odds they're gonna turn into a jerk go way up, and so are the odds they're gonna be fired. So trying to get that extra 10 or 15 feet will have a big effect. 
Another thing that you can do to reduce the exposure is to find a safety zone, a place you can hide where the assholes can't get you at least for a while. And the reason I have this crazy old David Wilson cartoon is this goes back to, the, I, 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 it was so long ago I had a full head of hair. This was like in the 1980s. This was a really long time ago. And my colleague Dan Dennison and I uh, in Michigan, we were sending a group of surgical nurses and we're standing there in the operating room operating uh, theater or whatever, and we're talking to the head nurse, and she describes this doctor who had a, a history of sexual harassment was a serious problem. As she describes it, this female nurse runs down the hall with this aforementioned doctor grabbing her bun. So she, she looks at us and goes, see? Well, a few minutes later, um, her and a number of the other female nurses went into the, um, went into the nurse's lounge, and we tried to follow them in. She put up her hand. You can't go near us in the nursing room in, in the nurses' lounge. This is our territory for safety. So finding a place to hide is, is, uh, can be useful. Um, use a human shield. This is what a boss is for. If you get a great boss, what a great boss does, and, and, and there's research on one of the functions of management is to buffer employees from disturbance and annoyance. If you can find a boss who serves as a human shield, that's another way to deal with the asshole. So that's picking your boss is really important. And so this, I love this quote from a sports director who wrote me some years ago. I always tell, university sports director, I always tell the people who work for me the same thing. My job is to hold the umbrella so the shit from above doesn't hit you. Your job is to keep me from having to use it. So that's such a symbiotic relationship. All right. One other thing that I kind of got obsessed with is this notion that when there's work groups, especially when there's sort of a jerky boss, that sometimes there's early warning systems where people formally and informally create social connections to warn that the nasty boss is coming or that the boss is in a particularly bad uh, mood. And I've gotten actually a lot of emails about this and there's stories in the press, but, but a great example of this, there's an old, not that old, Sandra Bullock movie where she plays a really nasty asshole um, publisher who is despised by all of her coworkers. She runs around and yells people and belittles people. And so they had an early warning system. And what happened was, um, so the movie was called The Proposal. So what happened was that her, her assistant um, um, figured out that she was going to be coming and visiting another, um, another um, building, another room. So that's what the email that was sent, the witch is on her broom, this sort of warning that, if you will, uh, there's an incoming ass asshole. So sometimes those things can help. All right. Um, I think that's enough um, avoidance techniques. Now let me talk about ones that are really powerful for reducing the negative effect of somebody who treats you like dirt on yourself without really changing the asshole's behavior or situation at all. So this is Dr. Aaron Beck. He's the modern founder of something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the most widely used evidence-based therapy actually in the world. And a lot of what happens in cognitive behavioral therapy is rather than just changing your situation, you reframe and essentially change your perception so that things that are driving you crazy and making you um, sick and making you anxious, you reframe them so they're less upsetting, even good things. So, so let me give you a few examples that are kind of loosely drawn from cognitive behavioral therapy. So one thing that happens in cognitive behavioral therapy is that you'll recode the threat as less nasty, threatening, upsetting than you did before. So let me give you a couple of examples of, of, of where I've seen this in my work and my research. So one of the heroes of my book, her name is Becky Margiata. Becky's just a magnificent human being, one of the most uh, accomplished social activists I've ever met in my life. Becky actually led a campaign called the 100,000 Homes Campaign uh, that found homes for more than 100,000 homeless Americans. She's a woman who can get, get stuff done. Um, so Becky in the 1980s um, went to West Point, the U.S. Military Academy. She was one of the few women in the early days at West Point. And if you know anything about West Point or, in fact, any military um, academy, there's a lot of hazing the first year. So Becky, she's a first-year plebe, and the typical thing that would happen, I love the way she describes it, is that um, so it's 9 o'clock in the morning and an upperclassman, upper-class um, cadet walks up to her 
and it gets in from her nose and says, repeat the major headlines of the New York Times today, this morning. This is standard hazing. So she said, you go and you try to repeat it, and of course you get it wrong, and they'd scream at you and tell you what an idiot you were one inch from your nose. So she said the first couple of weeks she'd get all upset, but then she came up with this strategy of just seeing them as these sort of brilliant people who were really, really funny, who really weren't hurting, weren't hurting her, they were sort of like a performance she was walking, watching in the theater. And you can see this idea of sort of not having it be that bad. And that's one of the things that helped her get through, and she became very successful. She was involved in special operations, had a very successful military career. Uh, bill collectors, uh, years ago in the 90s, I did some anthropological research on telephone bill collectors, the people who call us when you're late on your Visa and MasterCard. And one thing that we were taught, that we were taught when we'd get a screamer, somebody would threaten us, they'd yell at us, a lot of the whole culture was afterwards you debrief with your fellow collectors, and they'd all say the same thing, oh, that's nothing, you should have seen what happened to me. Standard sort of uh, solution. Okay, that's one. Another one, what I kind of like, is when somebody's nasty and abusive and, art, and all this sort of stuff, rather than to sort of lessen, lessen the, the degree to which it hurts you, is is rather than getting angry at with them, them, feel sorry for them and forgive them. So some of the expressions here, as you say to yourself, if you've got a jerky boss, she's like a porcupine with a heart of gold. Maybe there's some good in there. He's, I heard this at Google years ago. He's like a guy with a bad user interface but a good operating system. And the, the, the key thing here about having sympathy, having forgiveness for somebody who treats you badly is even if you don't change your behavior, there's all sorts of um, evidence that when you can forgive people and have some distance, it does less harm to you because you don't ruminate it. You're not obsessed with it. So in some ways, one way to blunt the effect of an asshole who even wants to hurt you is to forgive that person anyway. Okay. Another one which is kind of related, this is the Michelle Obama, when they go low, we go high um, philosophy. Um, is this notion that when people treat you like dirt, that you rise above it and say you're not going to stoop to that level. And, and um, when we're in the course of doing the research for the book, I ran into a guy named Jacob Jabber. Jacob Jabber is a CEO of a coffee chain that's mostly out here on the West Coast called Phil's Coffee. They're infiltrating other places like Washington, D.C. and the like. And they're really into this notion that they make you this custom cup of coffee and you have this relationship with your barista, Jacob calls it cups of love. And, and he said, his perspective was, our, our view is that if a customer is nasty to you, you throw the kindness back to them. You kill them with kindness. So one of my uh, students, she, I hired her, and she went out and did a bunch of interviews with Phil's um, coffee folks. And sure enough, you can see the quotes here, their whole culture was essentially to not to stoop to the level of customers and to kill them with kindness because acting like that is beneath them. So that's, that's another kind of interesting strategy. Then um, two more, two of my favorite ones. This one probably is one of the strongest evidence-based um, approaches if you're dealing with somebody who's a jerk, to create some um, distance between you and them. Uh, do a little imaginary time travel. They call this temporal distancing. There's great um, laboratory-based studies that show whether it's something like breaking up from a long-term relationship, having trouble with a test, that, that people who think about it in terms of how they're going to feel about it a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, rather than focusing on how upset they are, they tend to suffer much less upset, anxiety, depression, and so on. And when it comes to assholes, this is one of the things that I would see over and over again as a coping strategy. And, and one of my favorite ones, like I guess I'm doing a lot of military academy ones, is a guy wrote me that when he attended the Air Force Academy and he was being hazed, because we know this is part of the thing you're being hazed, he said he would look past them and he'd imagine it was three years from then and he was in his plane flying and this was nothing to get through to be able to have the privilege of flying the plane and it worked for him. So. A little imaginary time travel can be very powerful. Finally, um, in a lot of what I'm talking about, there's ways to become more emotionally detached and distanced from the person who is treating you like dirt. And um, 
So they call these reframing, sometimes emotional detachment strategies, they're called, all sorts of ways. And you can sort of see it in that Air Force uh, plebe uh, trainee that I was just talking about. He would find a way to do emotional distance. But one of my favorite one comes actually from a Stanford administrator I know who is one of the most serene people at dealing with, well, I hate to admit it, we're sitting here at Stanford around the table with multiple people, but we do have a few assholes, maybe fewer than other organizations, but we got them. So anyhow, so what this guy does, I almost use his name, that would be terrible, and, and I, I study these people, he doesn't, is he says, he imagines when he goes into one of these meetings that he's a doctor who specializes in studying different breeds of assholeism, of observing their behavior, of categorizing them. <clears throat> and what he does is the nasty, when somebody is nasty, instead of getting upset, he says to himself, I'm so lucky to see such a fascinating specimen of this rare behavior close up. And, and it actually works. So this idea of finding some ways to distance, and, and this person, it, it's amazing how skilled he is at this. So that's, that's one you might use that I should use, but I don't because I study assholes. Okay, so what we're gonna do so get your questions in. We're gonna talk for about five minutes about fighting back, five or six minutes. Then I'll wrap up and then I'm just dying to hear your questions. Okay, so if you are in a situation where there are people who are treating you like dirt, um, making the decision about whether or not to fight back or somehow or another change their behavior is something I encourage people to do, but with proper precautions. And some of the things you might wanna think about how much power do you have relative to the person who you're at war with? If, if you're the boss and have the power to fire the asshole, it's your company, you have all the assets, uh, it, you can probably fire them. If it's a situation where uh, you're, the boss is after you, there's senior powerful people after you, there's a powerful coalition, in that case, you gotta watch it and maybe you might get more power by um, causing a, or, or by forming a posse of people, but you really gotta be careful documentation, all sorts of evidence, both for legal reasons and, uh, and just for making the case that the better documentation you have, the better able you are to fight back against that jerk. And just, just to give you an example of a, of a recent case, a former Stanford undergraduate I actually met years ago, it's a woman named Gretchen Carlson. Some of you, many of you probably know the story. She worked for Fox News. She also, I, the reason I knew her, she was an undergraduate, was one of my students was dating her, and, he, and she became Miss America, so he did very well in the Stanford dating pool. So anyway, so, uh, so Gretchen, years later, so she's working at Fox News, and Roger Ailes, uh, then the president of Fox News, is constantly propositioning her and sexually harassing her. What she did was she got her iPhone out, and she recorded um, him hitting on her and, and making threats and so on. Uh, so she had very good documentation. One thing I should warn you, if you are in the state of California, it is unlawful to record people without their permission, but if you're in, you're in New York, it's legal. And there's also options. The harder you fight back, uh, my advice is the more, the better, if you can afford to not have the job, if you've got other jobs lined up, that's great. But if it's gonna cost you feeding your family or paying your mortgage, be a little careful, okay. So those are some warnings. Let's talk a little bit about uh, different, different ways to fight back. Um, one is, and this is especially if you're dealing with somebody who is an unintentional kind of asshole, I call it clueless rather than strategic asshole, who wants to be good but isn't quite getting it, pulling that person aside and saying you're hurting my feelings or you're being obnoxious, please stop. Um, so one of my favorite examples, this was actually at one of our SCPD, Stanford Executive Programs, um, I was talking to someone about jerks, and this woman comes up to me, and she's an executive vice president, and she says to me, so I had this great incident with my CEO last week where we'd have meetings, there'd be two of us. It was two women, four men, all executive vice presidents, and what would happen was, and there's lots of research on gender and interruptions, the male CEO was constantly interrupting the two women, never interrupting the other four men. So they carefully, they, they did a count, they brought the um, male CEO the evidence and said, look what you're doing, you're being sexist. He was horrified, he felt terrible about himself, and he changed his behavior, and in fact, he would ask them to count and keep doing it. Now, this is sort of the best possible situation because this is, if you will, a clueless rather than a strategic asshole, but uh, a, a lot of times you, you, it's good to assume good intentions. Okay, 
There are other types of jerks, other types of assholes who, well, they're doing it on purpose and they want you to suffer. I mentioned the Machiavellian assholes. Those kind of people are, in particular, research on Machiavellian is if you're nice to somebody who's Machiavellian, they take it as a sign that you're a doormat and they can keep pushing. And, and, and if you've got somebody like that, maybe biting back aggressively might be worthwhile. And so one of my favorite stories, when another email I got, is this woman wrote me about this major asshole she worked with. He was a retired U.S. Army major who was constantly berating her and getting nastier and nastier and nastier until, as it says, she gave him a hard stare very loudly and told him that such behavior was absolutely unacceptable. And he backed off. But a lot of it depends, as you know, one of my mottos, I guess, is know your asshole. That different assholes require different sorts of uh, um, approaches. Here's another one, speaking of knowing your asshole. So this is a CEO I met, and is, I, I can't name the company, but he's actually very proud of this incident. And, and uh, a very successful CEO in the 1980s, he built, uh, he was CEO of a, of a company that had a great IPO, very successful. All of you would have heard of it. But he was really kind of a rough guy who was really tough on his top management team. And he, had, and he told me this whole story. He approved it. We've talked to other members of the team. This is fact-checked. Um, and what would happen was he had a penchant for vegetable insults. So here's two of his fam favorite insults. You are dumber than a head of lettuce, and the average zucchini could figure that out. Okay. So this guy, I almost use his name, keeps insulting his team. So, that, so what they do to get back at him and send the message, can you be a little more civilized? So that's the boardroom of the aforementioned company in the 80s. He, he showed up and at everybody's place was a lettuce head with hats and sunglasses. That's his lettuce head at the front of the table. They made up T-shirts. They all laughed about it. But it delivered the message to this obnoxious CEO that can you turn it down a little bit? And he said to me, before I would start doing another vegetable insult, I would laugh and think about the T-shirt I was wearing or what happened that day, and it, and it, and it got me to calm down. So I, I like that story. All right. So one thing also in many of the organizations you're in, you can use the systems to defeat jerks. The, the, the example here, because uh, I always like to make sure that I have I'm equal opportunity of both female and male assholes, is there's this guy, or this woman, sorry, Captain Holly Graff, she was given a command of a very large Navy cruiser and uh, was one of the fastest rising um, young officers in the U.S. Navy. But word kept coming out that she was extremely abusive, yelling at, belittling, hollering, and swearing at, and also exploiting, for example, I think that she had some of the officers mowing her lawn and doing stuff like that and cleaning her house, too, some stuff like that. Um, anyhow. So what happened was that it was reported there was an investigation, and she wasn't fired, but she was removed from her command and given less responsibility. So that's a case where it actually works. Uh, I also do tend, before we move to wrap up, is I wish I could tell you that HR or even the law was your friend, but you've got to be very careful because in many organizations, HR is not your friend, and if you go to the system, they're going to protect the more powerful person rather than you. So knowing, if you will, knowing the system you're in and how much power the person has is really important. Um, and in particular, this is something else I should emphasize, uh, there's a guy named Gary Namey who runs the Workplace Bullying Institute, and he points out that, um, it's pro that it's legal in all 50 U.S. states to be an equal opportunity asshole. So if you're being discriminated against or abused because you're, you're a woman, you're a minority, you're some other protected class, you're disabled, you've got a better case. But even then, if you go through a legal process, it's always important to remember if you start getting deposed and everything, very often they will drag your name through the mud. And even if you win in the process, you may suffer quite a bit. So, so I'm a big believer in, yes, sometimes you can use the system, but don't trust it completely because it can turn pretty ugly and turn on you. Okay, let's move to wrap-ups. My general view of wrap-up is that if you are dealing with uh, workplace jerks, your job is to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And, and that's something we've all got to take responsibility for. And this chart might be a little hard to read. It was just in a Wall Street Journal article that I wrote. But the key thing that comes out of this, let me give you the headline. When you look at national surveys of bullying, there's numbers that don't add up. About 50% of Americans report that they have been um, victimized or observed repeated bullying over time. 
less than 1%, about one half of 1% are willing to admit that they have been the bully. So, and this is back to this notion that, uh, that we have very bad self-awareness and, and us human beings are very bad at admitting we do things wrong. And um, there's great evidence because of our lack of self-awareness, the worst way to figure out if somebody is a bully or an asshole is to ask them because we all have such bad self-awareness. The best way, if you are one or if you wanna find out if somebody else is one, is to ask the people around them. And in particular, if you want to contain your inner jerk, one of the best things you can do is to have close relationships, family members, mentors, coworkers who have known you forever, the people who will pull you aside and tell you you are blowing it, you are not being so nice. And one of my favorite examples, a great uh, historical couple, Clementine and Winston Churchill, uh, they were married for years, and what part of Clementine's job was to tell Winston the truth and keep him under control. And uh, there's this great letter that one of my doctoral students, uh, Joachim Lyam, sent me. Um, so it's 1940, it's the darkest hours of World War II, um, England's being bombed. This was around the um, period of Dunkirk, if you saw that film. And so Clementine writes this letter to Winston Churchill, which basically says, you're acting like a jerk, Winston. So I, I love this. What, one of the men in your entourage, a devoted friend, has been to me and told me that there is a danger of your being generally disliked by your colleagues and subordinates because of your rough, sarcastic, and overbearing manner. My darling Winston, I love the darling, I must confess that I have noticed a deterioration in your manner and you are not so kind as you used to be. And then by the way, she went on with this whole mini theory later on that if you do this, people will be afraid to challenge you with the truth. So, so I, I love that letter. Okay, two more, um, one more quick thing and we're there. Um, so if I would have sort of a mantra, it's this notion that, um, it's on you when it comes to dealing with asshole problems and you're not alone. So what you're doing is you're kind of in a world where you have to work with others to solve your problems and to avoid imposing it on them. And, and so the reason I have the picture of the two porcupines, there's a little story that ends the book that E.O. Wilson wrote about. It, was, it was, came to him from a friend of his and what it described was there was a cold night and there was a bunch of porcupines and they were all cold and when they all sort of slid close together and got too close, they'd poke each other and it hurt. That didn't work. So then they slid so far apart that they were cold. And what they did was they spent the night getting just exactly the right distance where they could have warmth without hurting each other. And what they from then on called that behavior was civility and good manners. And I kind of like that because if you go back to the asshole survival stuff, my perspective is that we all needed each other, we need to take responsibility, and we're not alone, and we're sort of like those porcupines, we're kind of shoveling back and forth, and every now and then we have to understand we poke each other, and every now and then we gotta understand we gotta get a little closer to each other to help one another. Okay, so that's the end of my prepared remarks. I'm looking forward to your comments and questions, and I'm excited to hear them. And now, let's get to the questions. Um, okay, so let's start out. We got some really good ones coming in. Okay, first one, what happens when the asshole is your boss? Okay, well that's a hard, so, so um, that's a hard question, but if you look at research on um, assholes who drive us crazy, there's, enormous, there's, there's an enormous amount of evidence that uh, bosses are the most troublesome assholes. In fact, it, the next person up the hierarchy um, for all of us, is, is the person who makes our lives wonderful or, or terrible or both. So a lot of asshole bosses out there. 80%, 75% of people identified as assholes in workplace studies are abusive supervisors, really high number. So there's lots of different strategies that I've talked about in terms of how much power do you have, do you have a posse, do you document, uh, do you just need to take it? So, so this is why you've got to formulate your own plan but let me just tell you about the evidence about the best way to fight a, a, an asshole boss, documentation and form a posse. All sorts of evidence, good anti-bullying studies is the more people are on your side and the more documentation you have, that way you get social support. And if you just go and complain about your boss, well, I don't know, if you're Gretchen Carlson, you got the recording, that might be enough and, and, and the big time lawyer, but for most of us, that's not gonna work. And one of my favorite examples of this, 
was, um, so this is a, an email somebody wrote me years ago, it was an animal control officer, and they had a member of, a fellow animal control officer constantly abusing them, swearing at them, making racist comments. They go to the boss, they complain, nothing would happen. So what they did was they formed, they, they put together what they called the asshole diaries. Each one of them for a two week period just recorded with dates all the different incidents and all the horrible things this person did. As a group, the five or six of them went to the boss and then that person was gone within a week. And that doesn't usually happen, but there you've got this idea of documentation uh, and, and a posse. And a lot of it does depend on the organization. There are some organizations where you can go to your boss's boss, but you damn well better know the political environment. That's a dangerous thing to do in some organizations. Advice, Bob. Um, the, um, here's a good question. Many of our participants work in distributed global oh. teams. Can you give suggestions for managing jerks when you're not face-to-face? -face? Yes. yes. And, and in fact, Pam Hines, who is one of our fellow faculty members, she's got an I and E, um, one of our new executive programs. She's one of the world's experts on this. So everything I know about this, I've learned from Pam Hines. So look at Pam Hines' stuff. But here's what here. So here's what the research on distributed teams. And in fact, even if you're in the same big room and you're working on Slack all day and you're not talking to people, it's just as bad as if people are in other countries, by the way. So to the extent that you don't have eye contact with people and you don't understand the context they're in, you are more likely to have problems. So the best thing you can do, and Pam Hines has all sorts of evidence, if, if you're in a distributed team, especially at the beginning of the project, if you can meet them even once face-to-face -face before the project begins, that really helps. And the other kind of stuff that Pam talks about when you do stuff that's distributed is it seems like it's wasting time, but it's not. So I don't know, if you're in Germany, you're on a phone call with somebody from India, and, and, uh, and then maybe there's somebody in Chicago or something like that, take two or three minutes. So there's evidence to support this. Ask them where they're sitting. Ask them what the weather is like. Ask them what their commute was like. Take a few minutes so to humanize and to be able to get some empathy for them. But working in distributed teams is really, really tough, but it's something that we all need to do. And to go back to the Slack example, or so many of us who work at home now, that almost all of us, even when we, um, in theory, all work in the same office, we're office, often essentially working on distributed teams. And, and, and the big warning from the research is, Whenever you don't have eye contact, and this includes the telephone, so what I'm doing to you right now, whenever you don't have eye contact with the people you're working with, that's when people start getting nastier and start having empathy problems. That's great. So I, here's a good question that actually I'm curious about as well. From reading your book, why are you so obsessed with toxic <laughs> enablers? Toxic, toxic enablers. Oh, Tell thank, us you. About that. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So toxic enablers. So. I've got this whole thing about I don't want you to be part of the solution. I mean, part of the problem, I want you to be part of the solution. Um, and, and for all of us, this notion that it's, it, it's on you and you're not alone, it's on us, you're not alone. But what happens in organizational settings is there are a lot of people who are out there, out there in companies and the private sector, politics and so on, who aren't assholes, but they clear the way for them. And they make it possible. And so my last book, um, uh, The No Asshole Rule, I actually had a chapter on the virtues of assholes, and I had a, a set of guidelines. If you want to be an, an effective asshole, make sure you've got somebody to clean up after you, sort of like after the a parade comes to town, the people who sort of like clean up the poop in the, in the paper and everything. And uh, old, old research by Peter Frost, uh, University of British Columbia, he, he identified these people, toxic enablers, toxic handlers, who after the boss would scream at people, after the boss would be abusive, what the, the toxic handler would do would go from office to office and tell uh, the people who, um, in this case, he abused, really he's not that bad a guy, he's not that mad, he'll cool down later. And then the other part of the toxic enabler that they do is when the asshole says, was I that bad? The toxic enabler, since there's a lot of ass kissing involved in this, says, no, no, you weren't really that bad. And I talked to them, they're not really that upset. So what you're doing is you may not be a jerk yourself, uh, 
but uh, you may be um, enabling somebody who is doing all sorts of destruction. And it's an interesting and sort of weird role. And uh, as I said, unfortunately, um, the other side of it, if you want to be a successful jerk, hire yourself a, a competent top toxic enabler. So I, I hate to bring that up, but it's true. So how do you, so here's the question, how do you determine if you're dealing with a natural asshole or one who's just been created by negative workplace dynamics? Oh, so this, this question, this is, this question is sort of, are assholes sort of made or born? So, um, so, so there is some evidence that people who were bullies in high school go on to become bullies in the workplace and they spend more time in prison and all sorts of stuff. But um, I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm glad you asked that question because one thing I don't think I've emphasized enough in this talk it is that there's all sorts of situations that turn almost all of us into temporary assholes. And if you look at modern life, if you're in a situation where you're rushed, if it's crowded, oh, if it's hot, if you're around other people who are jerky, um, it's, oh, an income disparity. So we're in this income and status disparity. Um, and, and to me, the perfect analogy is getting on a modern airplane with first class and, and, and all the different statuses. Uh, the United Airlines, which unfortunately um, I have to fly a lot, they have everything from business class, first class to the, the absolute – I think you can't even uh, put luggage in the overhead compartment for the cheapest seats. And, and so what they do is, is, is they, they create these um, status dynamics that's sort of a microcosm of modern life. So to me, there's two parts. One is you may have some deep-seated personality characteristics like narcissism that uh, make you very thin-skinned and very nasty, but you just might be in situations where there's just it, it, anybody would be a jerk. And, and there's some great experiments done with seminary students. So this is like these, the people are training to you know to be in the clergy, and they put them in a situation where they're in a rush. Um, and there's somebody lying on the street who seems to be dying. When in a rush, they don't stop and help them because they're in a rush. So being in a hurry is one of the, was one of the um, most reliable way to turn into a jerk. But yeah, you might have personality problems, but uh, beware of situations that can turn almost anybody into a jerk. Thank you so much, Bob. I have to say, we have a lot of questions we weren't able to get to. You can absolutely see the value of getting time um, with um, for experts like Bob here, and we just want to thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the hour and that you're better equipped now to handle any jerks in your workplace. And we encourage you, again, to check out all of our offerings at scpd.stanford.edu. And again, you'll receive a recording of this webinar to share with your friends and colleagues. And um, we wish you a great rest of the day.